The Coldest Winter Ever was published in 1998. And immediately after I wrote The Coldest Winter Ever, I began writing the Porsche Santiago story. And I was writing it, I did about 100 pages. Then I put it to the side. And the reason why I put it to the side was, I said, well, the coldest one ever already had such a strong reach with most of the women in our community. And I knew men read it too, but, but the, the outpouring was with the women in our community. And I said, there really needs to be a novel that, that's powerful enough to capture the masculine voice, uh, the masculine experience, uh, what's going on in the hood with our men. Uh, back in the day in politics, I would say we are at war, and it was something that I meant, and I felt that the reason why we were always victims in our community was because we weren't aware of that fact. So we were doing a lot of fighting, but we didn't know the difference between our enemies and our friends, and we didn't understand what the war plan was supposed to be or should have been. And so there was a lot of confusion. The thing about novels is it gives you an opportunity to read, feel, and think about things without feeling like somebody is forcing you or lecturing you or ordering you to do something. So there was a writer back in the day named Richard Wright. Uh, he wrote the book Native Son. But when I was a college student at Rutgers University, we had a course in Richard Wright, meaning the whole course, all we did was read his books. And one thing that I loved about the writer Richard Wright was that he explored all of the realities of our community through his characters and through his storytelling. And I thought that that was excellent, and I thought that that was also something that I could do. And so in my day and time, uh, because Richard Wright was writing in 1950 and 1960, in my day and time, I thought that there were some problems that were particular to us and our hoods that needed to be discussed. And I am happy that a lot of us started writing because of the coldest winter ever. And I think the only thing that was needed was us to know that our stories are important, uh, are of value, and that the words that we speak to each other and the scenarios that we experience in our lives, you can actually put that down on paper and turn it into a book that somebody can keep. One thing that my husband says to me is uh, that as an activist, I used to run around to every neighborhood, every hood, everywhere in the country, outside of the country. He said, you're going to exhaust yourself. What you need to do is have a product that can be distributed, that everybody can get at the same time, and everybody can read it, and if they can read it and they can understand, they can get the message simultaneously. So he is the one who really uh, pushed me to be a full-time author and not uh, so much just uh, working so hard trying to be everywhere and talk to everybody individually, small groups all over the globe. So I started writing and um, I never stopped since then. I call it pushing my pen. When I put the first 100 pages of A Deeper Love Inside to the side, I wrote Midnight Against a Love Story. And when I wrote Midnight Against a Love Story, I knew that it was going to be a rough ride, that people were, you know, oh, what is this, you know. But I didn't mind. It was okay. And uh, when I was having discussions within my family, people said, no, you shouldn't do the Midnight book. You should just do the sequel to The Coldest Winter Ever and tell them where they put the drugs and who shot who and <laughs> what happened. And, you know, that's what people want to hear. And I understood that that's what a lot of people wanted to hear, and that was what was popular. But to me, it didn't feel like what was necessary. And so I wrote what I thought was necessary, and I was ready for the battle and the debate. And I was ready for some people to be happy and some people to be disappointed, and I was ready for all of that. And for me, it's not so much being popular or pop culture but it's the purpose and the meaning behind each thing that I do. So I wrote Midnight Against the Love Story, and after that book, I wrote a second Midnight book called Midnight in the Meaning of Love. So for those of you who say, why did it take so long to write a deeper love inside? I didn't take long to write a deeper love inside. I wrote all these books in between, and now I finally wrote a deeper love inside. 
I hope that you're going to love this read. I hope that you're going to feel this character, poor Santiago, sister of Winter Santiago, definitely a unique young lady. She is her own person. Don't expect her to be Winter because that's not who she is. She's Porsche, the middle child in the Santiago family. I hope you'll pick it up, and if you do, I'll certainly sign it for you tonight. But I want to get into the nuts and the bucks of what's on your mind and what you want to talk about, and let's just open up the floor, and uh, y'all can just stop staring at me, and we can talk <laughs> like regular folks. <laughs> okay, anybody? Yes. So when you have uh, Midnight, and the other one that says Midnight, is that a sequel to that one? Or is it a, yes. That's a sequel to that one. This is Midnight One, okay. which is called Against the Love Story. Uh, and this is Midnight Two, which is called Midnight in the Meaning of Love. Uh, some people did get confused because the word midnight is in both titles. But you know, just think like Harry Potter. Harry Potter and the Adventure of the Stone, Harry Potter and the, you know. So what I was doing basically was trying to make it clear that these books are about midnight so that people wouldn't think that they were being misled. You know, clearly, once you see this and you see the title and you see the person, you know that this book is not about Winter Santiago, but this is a character that came from the coldest winter ever. The brother said he thinks it's good that I write about the sisters, but he also thinks it's good that I write about the brothers because it's better to not be on one side. I agree with you 100%. Um, I'm not the type of woman who thinks everything should be for women and all programs should be for women and all women are victims and all men are enemies. That's never been my style. Back in the day when I said we are at war and I talked about the black man and developing an army and being able to defend ourselves and knowing right from wrong and good from evil and friends from enemies, I always saw the unity between the black male and the black female as the foundation of everything. So I am not a woman who is predisposed to being against the black man. That's never been my, my thought or my feeling, or my style, and I've known a lot of good brothers in my lifetime, and the reason why I can say it like that is because I've been working in the community for so many years, so I, when I say I, I've known a lot of good brothers, I mean workers, soldiers, people who wanted to build a community and make it into a better place, people who made sacrifices, men who love their women and love their children and love their families and love life, so I don't have a... a uh, uh, a beef against the black man. I'm glad that you don't because I've been around uh, um, and it's great books, but I'm going to let you know because I've been around a lot of women that do and every single time I see them, they'll come across saying, well, if this dude got hit by a, a woman, the first thing happens is, what did he do? Did he cheat? Did he mess around? Mm -hmm. It seems like it's always blaming the man for something. But, you know, me as a person, I date a woman, it's just that woman, and that's it. I'm being a good man, doing the best I can while I'm trying. Right. And it seems like, you know, I still, it's, it's kind of hard mm -hmm. because a lot of women, some women, not saying all, some women can't appreciate that. Right. And and then a lot of times, uh, some women don't understand that, like, um, what a man goes through and the stress that they go through, mm -hmm. they go through a lot of deeper, more powerful insecurities, a lot of problems and struggles, and some women don't see that. Mm -hmm. They just see men as one thing, and they don't see the multiple dimensions of men. Right. He says that many women don't see the multidimensional nature of a man, uh, only see a man one way, don't understand a man's stress or trauma, and uh, misjudge him, and he thinks that that's wrong. Well, the most that I can tell you is that I also think that it's wrong. I think in self-reflection, you have to reflect on yourself and the other person. I don't think I don't think automatically that all women are right and all men are wrong. Um, I just don't think that because I don't believe that that's true. Um, when I 
in my writing, examine different types of women. I get a lot of criticism for doing that. Um, I think that black women historically have worked so hard to hold our families together, and it's been such an incredible struggle that we are now at the point where we're, we're not expecting to get any criticism because of all the work that we've done. We say, even if you think something is wrong, you better not say it. You know? But the fact of the matter is that right now we are having a crisis in the love between the black man and woman. And that crisis needs to be explored in detail and discussed in detail and traced back historically so that we can come up with a solution in the present, in the present day and time. So in exploring that crisis, we will have to do a critique and an analysis of the black man and the black woman, not one or the other. Because the fact that so many black women are dissatisfied with black men, and most of the black women have raised the black men, shows the contradiction. You know, if, uh, if you are raising your son to believe that every other woman is a bitch except mommy, then, you know, how do you move, how do you move, how do you move forward from that? Because ultimately your son cannot love you like a man loves a woman. He has to regard you as your mother. But he needs to go out there and get a woman. But he needs to get a woman who respects herself, and he needs to be a man who respects himself in order for there to be some kind of unity. And, yes. I know there was a work, uh, plans in the works to, to make movies out of the book. Is there still something coming out like that? Yes. Uh, his question for the people in the back who might not have heard it was about uh, converting the books into the film version. Uh, I've been saying for many years that when I initially wrote these books, I always wrote them with the intention of them becoming films. Um, and I've been in a lot of different business scenarios over the past 15 years. Talks with people, celebrities, all kinds of situations, managers, agents, whatever have you. But I never found the team that I thought could bring my work to the screen the way that I would like to bring it to the screen. I'm not really interested in just making a movie that's the same as all the other movies that have been made. I'm interested in having a renaissance in film, a rebirth, because I think we need a renaissance in our hoods, meaning a new birth, a, a new feeling, a, a resurgence of love, that kind of thing. Um, but right now, I am doing the paperwork for the coldest winter ever film deal. And so I say that so that people can be clear. In filmmaking, the business is first. The contracts are first. The agreements are first. And then everything else is down the road. Because normally when I tell the community I'm working on a, a film deal, they want to immediately talk about casting. Who's going to be Winter Santiago? <laughs> Who's going to be Mrs. Santiago? And I understand and I appreciate the enthusiasm, but when you're going through the paperwork, none of that is, is even an issue at the moment. Right now, it's, uh, you know, uh, who owns the rights, how much of the rights you're giving up, the cost of the rights, uh, who's going to be the director, things like these are the base level discussions in the making of a film. So yes, there will be films, God willing. And yes, I am currently involved in the paperwork for the film version of The Coldest Winter Ever. And for, for now, it's the most comfortable film conversation that, that I've had so far on the business end. So I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling confident about it. So hopefully, we shall see. In the back. Okay. Okay. Um, Uh, 
far as him being like a right hand man and him as dad, and how you showed how he, how you were shown from his lineage and how you were raised and all that, and he was just what you went through, and also what he went through with his wife and uh, with his respective wife. Are you going to show how he became winner's uh, dad, right hand man, and how he changed people in their life? Absolutely. The question is, am I going to show how Midnight encountered Santiago, how the story of how those two roads meet each other? Because so far I've shown uh, the young Midnight, his, where he comes from, his father, his family, his, his loves, his wife, so on and so forth. The answer is yes. I am currently writing Midnight 3, meaning right now that is exactly what I'm writing, Midnight 3. Midnight, um, to answer your first question, how was I able to so vividly capture Japan? In preparation for Midnight and the Meaning of Love, which is the second Midnight novel, um, my family, we actually went and got an apartment in Japan. And we stayed there and uh, traveled around the Asian continent. What I wanted to do at that time was I knew I was going to be writing about a character that was going to Japan, so I didn't want to just guess. And I think novel research is really important for those of you who are writers. When you're writing about something, it's important that you have some knowledge about the thing that you're writing about. So when we first went to Japan, I didn't just go to the obvious tourist places. I wanted to just move into a particular community, shop at the same supermarket as some women and in their hood and you know just get the feeling or the vibration i wanted to learn how to use the train system and the bus system how to get myself around uh, my family we uh took a language course before going over there so that we could speak the language and uh just to be keep it real with you I wasn't speaking fluent Japanese, but I was able to say, you know, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, uh, to the right, to the left, uh, backwards, forwards, you know, and, and, and be able to describe what kind of food I wanted to eat, uh, or if there was an emergency. I could do those kinds of things, but um, we took that course in order to be able to survive in that, in that environment. So while we were staying in Japan, we also uh, went and stayed some time in Korea and also in China. So the reason if you feel like when you're reading Midnight in the Meaning of Love, oh, this is like, a, I feel like I'm in Japan. The reason why you can feel like that is because I took the time to see how I felt when I was in Japan and what I saw and what I observed. So that was the preparation to writing Midnight in the Meaning of Love. So. I'm glad you felt it because it, it sounds like you felt it. But Midnight 3 is definitely coming, God willing. Question? Yes. I don't know what's happening with the ladies. <laughs> yes. Just on the Renaissance. Yes. And I'm going to believe in the Renaissance. The question there is, I have for you, I have a three-part question for you. Three-part question. Yes. And it's based on your movement, your book. I don't understand that question. Do I take donations? So donations far as your work, far as trying to put your own movie out. Did you take, did you take donations? Oh, 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 oh. Fundraising? Um, on the film version. Correct. Okay. On the film version, uh, I am developing the financial formula. So if somebody wanted to be like a shareholder, in the film, they could make an investment. So the answer is yes. And and that is the, the uh, independent film deal that I'm working on now. Based on that, that's the correct step to take or based on kind of put your own work out and be able to hold the power to your work. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I agree. And it was a long route. It was a long route to getting to the point where I did see that, you know, no matter what I'm working with, if I want it to be what I want it to be, I need to have a role in it. Um, not as an actress, but, you know, a, a role in putting the art together onto the screen. Right. Even doing that, putting the role together, that's what makes you a power play. Mm -hmm. and that's what makes the power to be. See, I want you to see you eye to eye now because you was able to raise enough funds to do your own work. Right. At the Renaissance. I'm from the Renaissance Action National Network, and we believe in culture, social, and economics, controlling what we do. Right. 
I understand. Uh, you know, <clears throat> people have uh, a lot of expectations and maybe a grand picture of things. Normally, an artist or even a person, an individual, is very good at one or two things. Normally, the person is not good at all these things at once, which is why it's always necessary to have a team. So I am not that financial, per I'm not a fundraiser. Even when I was running Daddy's House, the nonprofit organization for Sean Combs, I wasn't the money girl. He was the money cat. I was the service delivery lady. What that basically meant was I would gather up 200 kids from the community, take them to camp. I could write the curriculum, uh, develop a math class, an English class, a history class, and, and recreational opportunities. I could negotiate the lease for the camp, or the food contracts for the camp. I can do all of that, but I'm not a fundraiser. So um, in working on this film, what I have done is just gotten together a small team of people and allow people to do what they do well and what they do professionally, allow them to do that and then have me do my part. I think when we do it that way, then it can be successful. But if I try to, you know, overreach and get my fingers in every pot, then, you know, nothing would happen. Probably just fall apart. That's the correct step to take. That's Thank the step you. that we have to take. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Understand our weakness and our strength. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, you didn't say the third part of your question. No, that was two parts. The third part was, I know you're in the books, I like a shot for the Empire Connect, and we are having fun with you. Okay. So you know, down the East Coast, that's what we do. So we was, I was wondering, if you had a donation set up, we have events that we would donate to your, to your cause. Because we strong in black economics. Right. And we understand for you to have power, you gotta be, and for you to have your own vision, you gotta be to dictate the pace. Right. When the powers of be dictate the pace, they become their pace. Right. And what you might say is strong, they might not want you to stay with the strong. Right. They want a weak diversion. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was coming from on the third and final uh, statement. And that's always been the case. Right. If you want to say something that's strong, there will always be a power that doesn't want you to say something that's strong because the purpose of uh, the people in power is to stay in power, to maintain the present arrangement of power in that society. So um, I do understand that, and I have understood that. Um, and right now, I, for instance, have a publishing deal at a major publishing corporation it's not owned by our people, but it doesn't affect what I say when I write what I want to write. And I, when I turn my book into my editor, she doesn't remove one word from my page at all. Unless she says, oh, you spelled this wrong, and then I'll say, that's how I wanted to spell it. You know, <laughs> if that's the truth. Or if it's a correction, then I'll accept it as a correction. But in terms of the text of what I'm writing, Every word that you read on every one of my pages is the word that's supposed to be there. So I do understand you and I, and I hear you. Other questions in the back? Anybody? Okay. Sister. I was wondering who are some of your favorite authors? Who are some of my favorite authors? I always get this question and I should be more prepared for it, but I am a historian. And I know that doesn't sound exciting. <laughs> I am not a person who reads a lot of novels, believe it or not. I write novels, but I don't read them. So sometimes people ask me to comment on other novelists' work, and I'm at a loss to comment on it because I haven't read their work. And because my time is so you know, heavy and important to me because I have so much work to do, I'm either writing my own novel or researching the novel that I'm writing. Uh, when I get downtime, I read nonfiction, which uh, basically involves me reading about people who I either admire 
or I don't like at all, but I want to know their story, how they grew up, what shaped their mind and their thinking. So these are the kind of books that I write, uh, that I read, is normally under the genre of nonfiction, meaning true stories, uh, or stories of somebody's life, that kind of thing. So I've read, you know, everybody. I mean, it's not even, it's not even a race thing for me. Like, I'll read uh, Fidel Castro's autobiography, Malcolm X's autobiography, oh, Angela Davis's autobiography. Same way I'll read Brooke Astor's autobiography or, you know, uh, Gloria Vanderbilt's autobiography. But I just, uh, I love to read about real life and the things that impacted and shaped and developed people into becoming who they were and the challenges that they had in the era that they were living. These are all oh, things that teach me. About, uh, With a novel, uh, I normally read novels about from authors from other countries simply because my, my standard for a novel is you have to tell me or teach me or show me something that I don't already know. So I'm a person who simply cannot be entertained by something that's too familiar in novel format. So I'm not a big reader of novels. Thank you. Yes, sir. As, as a follow-up to, uh, as a follow-up to what the children were saying about uh, Is she new to be, about having a protective, uh, about being able to go into business and being able to speak, uh, without having to answer to other people. And uh, you want to clarify that, but what I would like to know is, uh, do you have some sort of um, protective uh, mechanism in place so that uh, when you speak out, the enemy won't come after you, especially with the laws that are in pl place, such as Homeland Security, uh, National Defense Authorization Act, where they can just come and take you off the street. Right now, Barack Obama is talking about having laws in place where they can use drones to kill Americans. So, um, so if, if you do have something in place, would you please let me know, especially behind the fact of uh, white, suprem white supremacy has escalated to another level now where it's not so much uh, over, but it's more covered up now, more so than it has ever been. Mm -hmm. Keep democracy up front in a hypocritic, in a hypocritical fashion. All right, he's asking me, do I have some kind of protection in light of the way the country is moving, the politics, the homeland security, and so on and so forth? Um, if I did, I wouldn't discuss it. Uh, because if you discussed your protection, then it wouldn't be protection. Um, what I can say and what I want to say is that I'm one soul, just like you. Every person in here is one soul. And I believe our largest protection comes from the maker of our souls. And that's what I truly believe, like no matter what anybody says, that's it for me. That's the largest protection that a person can have. Now, how do you get protection from the maker of your soul? I think you get protection from the maker of your soul by living your life within limits and boundaries, by being good on purpose, by not being evil, by not magnifying evil, by not encouraging or inspiring other people to be evil. You know, there is a, a, a saying um, that's in the Quran that says, uh, you know, uh, you plan... Uh, we plan, they plan, but a law is the best of plans, right? So uh, I trust in the maker of my soul, who is also the maker of your soul. And I do good. I work to earn spiritual protection. And like I said, if I had physical uh, protection, that wouldn't be a topic <laughs> tonight. Okay. Uh, one, one more. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. 
gave me one to know about your mind. So I would imagine your back to the group of sex. Mm. I haven't heard that much about mm. you know, in this conversation. But I know you more for no disrespect, you kinda of mm. your story from New York to Russell to you know what I'm saying, to just seeing, you know, the country, you know, the hip hop infrastructure touch in the political early nineties, you know what I'm saying, us coming into what we now see today. I'm more familiar with that part of your life. And I'm amazed that you were able to produce all of this from your mind and just such an inspiration. I feel like we truly are one of the connectors from the past that we have in our hearts from our parents, but you actually carried it over in a practical sense from the civil rights to the black liberation to the black art movement to the hip hop era up into what we see today as far as allowing the black people to kind of come together and really um, continue the emancipation progress by, you know, economics and bringing everything together as far as a, a renaissance of knowledge together of unity. So that's what I wanted to tell you, that I really appreciate this opportunity to let you know how much you mean to me and I listen to every word you say, every lecture, you know, everything that's meaningful that I hold on to be true, that I try to pivot to my philosophy in life and what I explain to other people has really come from you and you being that awakening activation point to provoke me to read Malcolm X and to provoke me to read the other classic literature that does give the other stories like you talked about, you know? Um, I did major in English in college, and I know that like those things that are inside of me, you know, came from believing in myself through you. Mm. So it's like I'm just amazed right now. But I actually did have a piece actually from you. Well, you started the intro. Thank you. So my first question uh, was actually based on what you said before. We talked about this on Twitter and a lot of the technological innovation. Mm. The way brought us together. But it does bring us apart as far as our social interactions do not really seem on you know, one-on-one -on -one communication on that. So what I was asking, as a young sister representing a collective of sisters um, from the Thomas Legislation, really every sister around the world, um, I was asking you, as a mentor in this, do you feel that there is a void in the struggle that has been left by the proliferation of technology? And you were talking about you um, getting the wisdom from your husband to uh, basically make your message you know what I'm saying, uh, mass produce, instead of you trying to mass produce one person. But is there a void, like should we still be out there? Because that's what we try to do, like we ride SEPTA all the time, whether it's cold or hot, and we just talk to sisters and young mm -hmm. mothers and brothers that just got out of jail and try to set up systems so everybody can come up together. So I'm asking like, should we still be doing it like that or is there a better strategy? And my second one was, one of our strategies is education, mm -hmm. like just every way, like inside and outside the classroom, you know, country schools close in Philadelphia. I'm mm. sure a lot of people are aware of it, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's real relative to the state of every black city in America right now. And um, I just wanted to know as far as like, you know, we're trying to do like homeschools and get kids to really have, you know, different people, not only um, bring their children and bring it back to that fashion, but to understand that everybody's a teacher. You learn it from everybody and we all have skills and we ain't gotta be certified through this system to have the permission to teach our children and teach our knowledge. Um, so I'm asking as far as curriculum, Everything that you have done as far as putting the message in your book to the different people that you know that, you know what I'm saying, we all know you know, and how you still do make your moves, like, how, do you have a recommendation on like a, a good curriculum or a good thing that you know that, you know what I'm saying, can help us push these young brothers, these middle school kids, but you know, every, you know, just any kind of direction. What's your name? Lori. Lori? Yes. Okay, Lori. Thank you very much. Um. <clears throat> First thing you mentioned was no disrespect. Uh, no disrespect is nonfiction. So when I'm talking about my novels, a lot of times I don't mention no disrespect. It's a different uh, category altogether. But if you have read no disrespect to me, it gives you a better foundation for reading my novels uh, because you will understand the author's mind a little bit better. At the same time, No Disrespect is the story, uh, a young story, a young story, a young movement before I got married, before a whole lot of things. If you are looking through No Disrespect, you'll notice that the main speaker doesn't refer to herself by name. Uh, and that's because through the collection of my experiences, I became soldier. In no disrespect, you are seeing all of the things that I saw 
and some of the things that I experienced and some of the people that impacted me in various ways, including emotionally. Uh, but you're not seeing the, the actual blossoming. Okay, so um, I also love No Disrespect because No Disrespect created the first bridge uh, that I had into books. And No Disrespect became big first in the prison system. It was black men who were the first readers of No Disrespect. Black men gave No Disrespect to their wives, girlfriends, sisters, and daughters. Sister Soldier was introduced to many, and I might even say most, black women by black men. So that's how that movement occurred. So I still have a great love for no disrespect, but I do also see a need for me to write, you know, the follow-up to that. Because when you read No Disrespect, you're seeing a person who is politically and academically um, advanced and very young. But you're seeing a person who wasn't, uh, didn't blossom into her cultural or spiritual understanding, into wisdom, yet. So it doesn't mean that anything is wrong with it, because nothing is wrong with it, in my opinion. Uh, it just means that there is uh, there are some diamonds or some jewels that are not in that book that need to be in the next book that follows up from that book. So that's the first thing on no disrespect. Is there a better strategy? Uh, just think of it in terms of an army. You have to have soldiers, foot soldiers, people on the ground. You have to have captains and lieutenants and generals and so on and so forth. So is there a purpose? Absolutely. But I believe that what you describe should come out of a youth movement. When I was in that movement, that's what I was. I was a youth. When we built camps for homeless children and for homeless families and took them out of New York City's welfare hotels and down to North Carolina for the summer and developed all those curricula, I was like 19, 20 years old. The children that I was working with went from age seven to about age 16. I wasn't even old enough to be their mother. And the camp, the camp counselors were people who went to Rutgers University with me or friends that I had from the student movement from UCLA and from Columbia University and from Howard University. That's how we put that together. See, when you're young, you have an opportunity to not be responsible for as much as you're responsible for once you are married with children and, and gainfully employed or running your own business. So ideally, the things that you're talking about, getting on the bus, talking to people, uh, developing um, uh, collective kind of stores with, with lower priced foods and healthier foods to eat and teaching women about womenhood and men about manhood, all of those things we did, we did as young people. And so I believe that if you're a college student or not, you're just a youth. A college student, a youth, a high school student, your mind should be actively engaged in movement. And that's how you learn the lessons of life. This is the route to becoming wise. And becoming wise is not about becoming proud. Becoming wise is about becoming more useful to your community and to your people and to your family. And becoming wise is about being able to carry yourself in a way where you can have a family and you can be respected where you don't think you're supposed to be disrespected and you're supposed to be abused. And also it's about being able to function in a family with a man who you love and respect and admire, who you don't treat like he's your son. You know, so to me, that's what it's all about. So the strategy is, is still useful, yes, but the strategy itself uh, needs to come out of the youth movement and the youth movement uh, needs to be not only involved in activism, but in reading and, and studying history and analyzing and preparing themselves so that they can actually do things that make sense instead of doing things that end in a chaotic way. And the last question about the curriculum, I basically took 
the curriculum from high school and college, and all of the books that I discovered at the Schomburg Library in Harlem, and put together a curriculum. Again, I was able to do that because I was a student. I spent a lot of time in the library. The same way you seem to be able to talk knowledge knowledgeably about certain things, you should be able to put them onto paper and divide them into categories and courses so that other people can not only listen to what you say, but they can learn what you're saying and then they can also do what you're saying. So that's how we bring each other up. Instead of just making followers, we make people who can you know, be one soul that stands on their own two feet and, and gives a powerful um, example to the next soul that's watching. Okay, yes. Thank you. He just wants to say thank you. You're welcome and thank you. Thank us and thank God. Yes, ma'am. In the back. She wants to give me some more jobs. <laughs> Thank you very much. I agree, no disrespect needs a follow-up, and the follow-up is something that can be useful in the lives of a lot of young women and men, and uh, I'll get to work on it. <laughs> I'll get to work on it. Yes, the sister right behind me. Yes. 
I am writing right now, Midnight 3. I am writing Midnight 3. And I do love a sister who loves the Midnight series. <laughs> so, That's beautiful. Yes, I am writing Midnight 3 right now. And um, even when I wrote Midnight 1, 2, and 3, and all that is in my head. It's like the characters are in my mind. And the characters continue to talk to me even after I put my pen down. So, yes, I actually look at the Midnight series not as the author, but as a fan. <laughs> so, I need to finish Midnight 3 also just for myself, <laughs> you know, not as the author, but as a reader or as a fan of the series. Um, I just wanted to say about you, you're bringing your son. I think that's a good thing. And I also wanted to say about you giving your son the book, uh, the Midnight Books, eventually when you feel he can digest it. This is very important. Uh, a lot of women who um, didn't like the Midnight series uh, kind of didn't want their sons or loves or boyfriends or men to read the Midnight series. But after I wrote the first Midnight book, the first person that I handed it to was my son. Um, I think that some women are afraid that if their men read this book that the men are going to critique them or see their flaws or anything like that. But that shouldn't matter. We want to raise men who are comfortable being men. We're in an era where masculinity is under attack and manhood is under attack. And there's a lot of men who are celebrities who are misleading our sons. And there's a lot of women who are arrogant and saying they don't need no man, they don't need no husband, their kids don't need no father. I brought him the Jordans, he got the Jordans, what do I need that nigga for? You know. <laughs> This whole attitude has been so destructive because our sons don't have somebody to look at even to understand what the visual projection of a man is supposed to be. So you don't want to raise a son as a woman who stands the same way you stand and bats his eyes the same way you bat your eyes. I've had women come up to the table, ask for an autograph and say, Yes, this is soldier, but you know, I'm not with all of that man thing and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but you're standing here and your son has breasts. If you had a husband, he would make your son do push-ups. He would make your son do push-ups and he would teach him what the visual uh, aspects of his manhood are supposed to look like and be like and how to discipline himself and challenge himself and what his voice should sound like and what his stance should be like and what his thoughts should be like. Somebody that guides him from being a young boy into manhood. So I am for the reuniting of the women and the men under the original definitions. <laughs> under the original definitions. <laughs> you know, and um, I'm not apologetic about that. Even in my, my own life, I'm married. My husband and I have been together for 23 years. Same guy. <laughs> okay, now, I, I'm not saying by any means that is perfect, and I'm definitely not saying that it's easy, but I am saying that it is the best thing for me and the best thing for us and the best thing for our children. All of us are supposed to be organized into family units, and all of the family units make up a community. Once the love is sucked out of the community, you don't have anything left but chaos. And so what I'm trying to do as one soul, as one woman, as one person, is I'm trying to fight against the chaos that has become so comfortable to us. It's not okay for us to be comfortable to assume our sons will go to prison once they turn 13. It's not okay for us to, you know, big up the guys who did go to prison because, you know, they, they did so many push-ups that they so buff and ooh, look, and he came back home from up north and blah, blah, blah. We should expect more. And we should give more. And we should teach more. And if our sons don't know how to be men, that's the point at which we have to reflect on ourselves as women. 
Why don't our sons know how to be men? Oh, because his father abandoned me. Okay, but let's take it back even further than that. Where did you meet his father? What did you do? What did you do before agreeing to do something? <laughs> All right, so now, if we as women don't learn how to count spiritually, one, two, three, four, five, and we do everything out of order, we should expect to know that we have sacrificed our children in the process. So if we go to the club and we meet somebody in the dark after we pop them mollies and smoke a few blunts, <laughs> And that's where you met him. You don't even know his name, whatever the case. You, you sleep with him, and then you get angry because he didn't call you back. Now you're calling him a dog. He's calling you a bitch, and you're pregnant. How does a man and a woman who look at each other as a dog and a bitch, which is the same thing, bring up a powerful seed, a powerful son? Or daughter. So these are the things that we have to correct about ourselves, and that includes me. And if I was to write, you know, no disrespect part two, it would be correcting myself. And then maybe I could show y'all me correcting myself, and then you could use it to correct yourself. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm coming around. Right. Only one. Only one. So listen, the sister is an attorney. She's saying that out of 400 young men headed to the pen, only one of them had a father out of 400, and how shocking it was for her after she graduated from law school and encountered the system. And uh, you know, that is, that is so clear to me and so obvious to me. We had nights in our summer sleepaway camp where the young men were just wilding out. I mean, the youngest of them wilding out the most, the six and seven and eight year olds wilding out the most. And when the male counselor sat him down to try to get to the root of what is the problem, one of the male counselors said, how many of your fathers are incarcerated? And every hand went up. I'm talking every hand. We had 200, maybe 225 young uh, children in our summer sleepaway camp. And so I have seen firsthand working through the emotional problems of fatherlessness. I've seen firsthand dealing with husbandless women who think they don't need any husbands, who have foul attitudes and bad intentions, women who don't love their kids because they remind them of the man who impregnated them who they didn't know in the first place. Uh, so I've seen this firsthand. So this is the chaos that, that we need to not deal with as shame. We need to deal with it as how are we going to fix this? <laughs> how are we going to correct ourselves so that we can become better souls and more and more useful to, to one another? And this, of course, is in all of our families. Because I couldn't line my family up here and, and show you the perfection of it. <laughs> I'd have a story <laughs> for each person, even in my, my own family. So these are, these are things that matter to me, matter to you, matter to us, matter to we. Um, a deeper love inside deals with this a lot because the difference with uh, Portia's journey is that she sees the flip side, meaning when to sort of come up when the money was good and everything was rolling, she saw all of that. But Portia saw the aftermath. And so this character right here, she's a tough little sister, but she's dealing with a lot of emotional trauma from trying to get it back to where it was or try to get it back to the love. 
and she 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 goes she runs a little bit deeper uh, emotionally than the character Winter did. Anyone else in the back? Okay, I just want to include the people in the back also. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> New authors. Well, I think that you have to do research on the publishing industry so that you can work the industry for what it has to offer you and your product. Uh, one thing that I did uh, when I was working on my, my midnight deal, before my midnight deals, I read uh, Publishing for Dummies, mm -hmm. which is a book. And I read How to Get a Publishing Deal for Dummies. And even though you, you might not like the title of those books, it was written very clearly in plain language how the industry works, what to do, and what not to do. What was most important for me in the How to Get a Publishing Deal for Dummies was it taught me all of the contract points, the things that were on the contract about the distribution, the different agreements, the rights, the territories. I'm saying this because some people write because they just love writing. There's a difference between writing as a hobby and writing as a business. So if you have actually written a book, that's only one step. If you want to turn it into a business product, you need to be able to work the whole publishing industry apparatus. So I would suggest that you research and those are two titles that can definitely get you started so that you can make a decision about whether you want to distribute your book independently, meaning on your own, whether you want to go through a major corporation like uh, some of the big publishing companies, in which case they take, they, they might give you a big advance and then they take a, a, a huge royalty from you on the back end, or whether you want to upload your story on uh, Amazon.com where you keep 70% of the profit and they take 30% of the profit, but your book is essentially a digital book, not, not necessarily the, the hardback. So there are several ways to get involved in this business, but you should do the research before you agree to anything. That's the main thing. I think publishing is like anything else. You can't be lazy about it. Like you gotta read, you gotta study, you gotta do the, you know, you gotta do the work to make it pop. Okay. Well, thank you. At the end. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the lady who wanted to ask the question. It's actually me. Okay. In preparation, well, for preparing my son that I wasn't going to come stay home tonight. I told him I was coming to see you. Mm -hmm. And he said, who is he? He's a soldier. Mm -hmm. I said, you too, but come back and tell me what you think. The video that you saw with the bomb was the one where you talked about Natasha Hart. I can't remember what form that was in the, in the White House. Right. And he researched it. And he came and he said, Mom, that's much like the Trayvon Martin situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm just interested in knowing how you view today's racial relations versus, you know, years ago in the 90s, late, late 80s to now. And the second, have we progressed, I guess, is more of my question that we remain the same or limited. And the second question is, do you have any Okay, the first question, how do I feel about race relations from back in the day uh, in a popular case like Latasha Harlins and present day like uh, Trayvon Martin? Well, I actually feel that back in the day, even though we were experiencing an onslaught of racially motivated murders, killings, assassinations, that the thing that we had that was better than what we have now is that we had a movement. Now, I can speak about New York because that's where I was at that time and give you an example. We had what we considered to be revolutionary attorneys, C. Vernon Mason, Alton Maddox, um, um, mm, uh, yeah, William Kunstler, Lennox, uh, attorney Lennox Hines. We had probably, 
I can say about 15 very, Colin Ferguson, very high profile uh, revolutionary lawyers. We had revolutionary teachers. We had revolutionary ministers. We had, and we had a coalition. So even though we were experiencing an, an onslaught as a community, we had a student movement, we had a youth movement. Uh, when I was a student at Rutgers University, for example, uh, we didn't have all this social media that, that you all and we all have now. So we actually went from campus to campus organizing, meeting each other, and having strength between our student governments and our student movements. When I was a student at Rutgers University, I had friends at Columbia University, at UCLA, at Howard University. I had friends at Harvard. I had friends all across the globe. And I'm not saying that to highlight friends, but people who were also conscious, who were also working uh, to try to beat back the onslaught and redefine how we could live peacefully and safely in our communities. I don't think that that's the case now. Like one young lady here said, we have so many leaders, but I'm not sure I can agree with that as, as what's happening right now. Um, so today we have uh, the dilemma of, because we have an African American president, people believing that everything is okay, but meanwhile the same things are occurring that occurred before we, we couldn't even conceive of the idea of ever having an African-American president. So like right now, today, this week, tomorrow, and yesterday, uh, there are young black men being executed by the police in Brooklyn. Uh, there are young black men with their faces down on the pavement, uh, you know, being mistreated and, 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 and corralled like cattle into a criminal justice system you know, that sucks all of the masculinity and fathers and sons and brothers out of our community. So, yeah, right now that's happening. And in the 80s, that was happening. But the political uh, structure is different now for us because we have less contact with each other, less movement. Uh, the important thing is that if you were to study, well, what is the reason why it's like that now? It wouldn't be necessarily because there's face, Facebook or Twitter or any of those things. It would be because the people that did step up and provide the leadership for the community all came under the attack. And they were attacked individually, and they were attacked personally, and they were attacked financially. So they were put under so much pressure to have to survive as individuals that they could no longer provide that community leadership that they had pro provided so forthrightly at that, at that point in time. Right. When I was a college student, when we had uh, funds for programming, we didn't invite Little Wayne. I mean, we, 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 <laughs> we called in the world leaders. We could get a president of, a, of an African nation or a Caribbean nation to come sit down and talk to us about nation building and what it's like to reconstruct an economy. These were the type of things that we had access to. When I was a student, you know, we could bring Jesse Jackson and say, oh, we agree with this, but we disagree with that, and we need you to do this or that or the other thing. We were all connected. And um, I don't want to glorify it, but it was a movement, and it was a movement that had every ilk, every kind of person in it, and not just the professional class, but the working class, the foot soldiers, the lieutenants, the captains, it was more of a of a, a movement army back then than there there is now. Now I think there's a, a certain level of desperation in our community, and um, and and uh, not just desperation, but um, a, a feeling of great frustration and, and not knowing how to respond, uh, and 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 always having to be in a reactionary mode where we're re reacting to a crisis as opposed to having built something to. Uh, to know that this is what's going to happen and, and to be prepared for it when, it when it does happen. All right, I want to get people who haven't asked a question. Yes. Hi. My name is Isis Sagan. I'm a local uh, hip hop artist from Philadelphia. And I wanted to know your thoughts on women in hip hop um, in this era. And I also wanted to know um, what advice would you have for a uh, female artist that's kind of just trying to penetrate um, the system right now? And thirdly, how would an artist such as myself gain your support, um, the support of revolutionaries like yourself? 
Okay, one question for the people in the back who couldn't hear it. Well, what is my opinion of women in hip hop today? Um, I can just tell you my honest opinion, which is that I don't really have an opinion. I don't think that they have taken a meaningful or strong stance for me to even pay attention to them. So I don't even feel like I know them. I, they, they feel unfamiliar to me. They might even feel like alien to me. I think that if you're a person and you're not doing something good and you're not projecting something good or strong or powerful, something necessary and something useful, something right and something capable, then it's very hard to get my attention. Um, and that's that's the truth of how I feel about it. Now, I know that might irritate some people, but that's the truth. Uh, when I was talking movie deal, you know, there were some people that were like, oh, you have to have Nicki Minaj's winter. You know, what? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, this, is at, this, this is at the business table. This is not in the hood. This is at the business table. We must have her as winter. What do you think of her? I said the same thing I said tonight. I don't think of her. You know, it's, it's, I don't think of her. Not at all. So, um, what would I say to a new artist? I think with the technology now, you have a lot of different ways to be an artist. Um, one thing I learned from my nieces, nephews, and my own son is that the youngest generation now doesn't even deal with regular television. They have, they have celebrities on YouTube. They have a whole network, a whole underground movement that doesn't even necessitate, doesn't even need um, a deal. You don't have to get a deal at a major uh, record company or anything. It's not like that anymore. So uh, my nieces, nephews, and son, they can pull up people who they can show me who are celebrities that I never heard of, that I've never seen. And then they can show me footage of that person performing to 20,000 people or 10,000 people or whatever have you. So the technology now makes it possible that you can always showcase your talent. And if your talent is something that connects with people, it moves souls, then it'll catch on. It doesn't necessarily have to go through the old traditional route of the major you know, music companies. And most of those companies are struggling now anyway. The digitalization of business has created a completely different phenomenon than the one that, that I grew up in and that some of the other uh, elders in the room grew up in. So it has done some good things and it's done some bad things. The good things that it's done is it's given access to people without you having to go through the whole racial discrimination thing because you can access that, that network and you can display yourself and then Everybody around the world can decide, am I feeling that or am I not feeling that? Or would I like to buy that? Whereas before, there were like top 10 companies that get to pick the talent. And those were the only entertainers we get a chance to see. Those were the, the only entertainers that got their products distributed. So now it's not like that anymore. So I think if you either are a techie or you know a techie, that it's important to showcase your talent and use the technology to make your, your art form uh, be felt and loved and viewed um, and useful all around the world. I'm amazed by 15 and 14 year old kids that are uploading films and getting advertisers to buy space on their on their page. So because the advertisers and the major corporations are so out of it, they have to go to the YouTube and the other places and look and see, oh, this has one million hits, this has a million and a half hits. Now we'll we'll pay this guy so that we can advertise our product on his page. He can continue to do what he does, and we just want to advertise on his page. So it's amazing now because you have a lot of teenagers who are businessmen and businesswomen and who are very successful. And so I think that that is a, a highway that's open to you now that, that, isn't, that wasn't open to us before, and I think you should use it, especially if you find that the traditional route is just too narrow or uh, too pop or just or just too boring. You know, I think you should use that other form of technology. All right, so let me see what time is it? Because I know some people just want their books signed. Yes, ma'am. Somebody said. What time is it? So all right, okay. I'll take the questions till eight, and then I will go into the signing. So that's fifteen minutes. More, and I want to take the people who haven't asked a question first. In the back. You want to ask a question? 
That's funny. Um, I don't know if you would need to call Jesse Jackson this in 2013. <laughs> um, no, and no disrespect to him. I'm just saying that you know the 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 ter the the errors, the time keeps moving, right? Um, my suggestion: a lot of people who are activists, get, young activists, get frustrated because they think that they're working, but nothing's happening. Or I'm working, but no one else is. Or I'm working, and, and you know, I don't see the results of it. This is the thing about activism, and I can tell you this for sure. I'm now, at this point in my life, somebody who you recognize, or a name or a face that you recognize. When I started out, for me, it was not about recognition. I was just a young person who was outraged at the way the, the youngest people in the society were not going to get a chance to blossom and to live and to shine. So when I started, the first uh, thing beyond student activism for me was working with the homeless youth, children who were seven and eight years old. I didn't worry at all about who else was doing it who was watching me do it, whether I got any coverage on the news or not, none of these were questions. I think now we have a society where you all, a lot of young people are used to cell phones and they take pictures of everything, then they Instagram it, this is me, you know, then they write their personal diary on the Facebook and you know, this is me in the bathroom and you know, it's just, it's a different era. So everybody, kind of, not everybody, but a lot of people see themselves as little walking celebrities, little mini celebrities. This is not the mindset of, of an activist. It's not the way that you are supposed to be. So what I would say to an activist who is young is know why you're doing what you're doing, know who you are, know what you think and what you believe, and know what your goal is. For me, when I started with the homeless youth, my goal was to get them to understand their value and to get them, even though they were young, to be able to do things that led to them having a better life instead of a death style. That's what I started out with. One thing I understood when I encountered these young people was I didn't go up to them and say, hey, have you read about Marcus Garvey and the UNIA? You know, I didn't go up to them and be like, you know, start reciting history to them. Because kids in the hood, that's not where their head is at. The first thing that I had to do was establish a trust. A trust. How do you establish a trust in your community? One, young people want to know that you're not going to abandon whatever it is that you're involved in. So you establish, a you establish a daily presence or a weekly presence. By you showing up, just by you caring, spending time, conversing with them, talking with them, showing them some basic stuff, that is the building of a trust. It would take me a year, a year and a half to build a trust with a community of young people. After a trust comes a love a concern for the outcome, knowing who their parents are, talking to the parents, trying to help them solve problems that they're experiencing right then and there. And after the, the trust and the love, then you can get to the information that they need to in order them to become independent thinkers who can still work on a team. Oh, so it's important rapper. not to get discouraged because it didn't make you famous, not to get discouraged because people aren't throwing money into your organization, but to keep up the work and to remember the reason why you started the work in the first place. 
When I first started, I didn't have any funding. I had a job, and at my job, I was making something like $200 a week. But I invested any money that I had left over from my rent in those children that I was working with. I didn't say, like, who's going to reimburse me? <laughs> Here go my receipts or anything like that. Clothes that I had, I took off my back, I gave to them. Why? Because it was just, I was motivated only by my love and my concern for my people, and that's it. It wasn't about starting. What caused me to be able to become a person who people recognized and admired or supported was that people saw my consistent presence. They saw me just continuously doing it. When I first started out, you would think my name is the girl with the kids. They go to the girl with the kids. Did you see on the train, the girl with the kids. I bring all of my, my young people to the restaurant. Where's the girl with the kids at the restaurant? <laughs> people who are black business owners, small black business owners, started to call me into their business and say, oh, I think that's really great. What you doing with the kids? How can I do it? Some uh, black man owned a video store. He started giving me videos, books, everything. People started making donations, everything. I was able to have the camp because of the community. And I had the support of the community because of the effort, the presence, the consistency, the genuine nature of the work that was there. So that's what I recommend. And uh, <clears throat> that might be the hardest thing to achieve, but it will teach you whether you are real or not. It will, it will teach you that. Okay. Brother Hakim, did you want to say something? No. No? <laughs> okay. I come to see when you're done. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm a school counselor. I've been working with children for 15 or so years, um, and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the midnight book, thoroughly. But my question is, you went in so much detail, like the brother asked it earlier, but you went in so much detail about his culture and his life early on in the beginning. Is it based on just research or anybody you knew or a collection of people you know? I mean, so much detail about his culture and stuff. It was amazing. So was it based on research or people you knew or person or... <laughs> This is what I say now, just to be clear. Right, I believe that the maker of our soul gives everybody a gift and an assignment. Writing was my gift, and these books are my assignment. I cannot uh, give you the ingredients or the formula of how come it turns out the way it does, other than to say, thank the maker of my soul, thank you for this gift. And I think when we admire each other, we admire each other on a subconscious level, you say, hey, she's using her gift to do her assignment. And people who get angry, those are people who are not using their gifts and not doing their assignment. I hate her. <laughs> you know, and then they, they have a negative reaction to it. So the most I can say is that, you know, I love I love words. I'm a woman of words. When I argue with my little nieces and they try to, you know, trick me with their little slick tongue, I said, I am a woman of words. I remember words. I know exactly what you said. I know exactly what I said, and you are not going to outword me in this conversation. And this is how we, we do it. I'm a woman of words. I love words. And I feel like every word in my books, I'm plucking them from my soul. The, the, the major thing that I thought about The Midnight was that I work with children, boys, all the time, and it kind of made me a little emotional because I never really encountered young men that behave like that. So I was just blown away, blown mm. away, because I work with youth, and it's it's kind of sad that we don't have a lot of young, respectful men like that. I mean, it was just just blown away by the book. So, you know, congratulations. Thank you for writing it, and I will definitely, when I have a son, have to read it. <laughs> she said when she had the son, she would definitely have him read Midnight. Um, I just want to say something about what you said, uh, that you haven't encountered a young man like Midnight. That, 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 that many. Like, it's not, like, no, I more. understand. <laughs> I got you. And some people read um, a deeper love inside and said, well, do you think that's realistic? And I said, well, what you believe will be based on the limits of your own mind. They won't have anything to do with the character. What do I mean by that? Um, 
I don't want to use the, the Porsche book as an example because so many people haven't read it yet, but let's use Midnight as an example. People say, nobody so young can do this and nobody so young can do that. I've seen young people do this. I've seen young people who love their parents. I've seen young people, and the difference between young people whose parents own a business. Maybe Brother Hakim's children who see him in the store doing business, ordering inventory, packing books, going out to the community. They're not going to be the same as children who didn't see that. They're not going to be the same. So what I tried to show is that it does matter what you do with your young people when they're one, when they're two, when they're three. Now, there's an American thing that uh, takes children and, and believes that they're supposed to play for the first 12 years of their lives. <laughs> and so, you know, every time they get together, they're throwing them crayons. Here, throw them crayons, scribble on paper, you know, or somebody is singing some retarded song to them. You know, three by my, see how to run, you know, crazy stuff. And this happened in my childhood also, and I'd always, I just would always be like, what are they talking about? Like, what are we discussing? My point is this, there are countries in this world that don't take a young person as somebody who is incapable. There are countries in the world where a young man gets a driver's license at age 10. There are countries in the world where young people get married when, uh, right before they become sexually active. You know, uh, a lot of people said, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I don't know, Sister Soja, with these young marriages. And I'm saying, you're saying you don't know, and the reason why you're upset, and you're saying you're a Christian, but it's not because of Islam that he has to marry before he has sex, because that's also the rule in Christianity. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's also the rule in Judaism. It's not enforced, it's not even discussed, and it's, it's seen as, it's not even possible. <laughs> so that's why when people see it put into a story format, they say, no, this is not realistic. This is not possible. No. Not only is this realistic, and not only is it possible, this is happening in other societies, and it's how it's supposed to be based on these major faiths that we all say routinely we believe in. So we have to then, when we read these stories, reflect on ourselves as parents. Now, if we have daughters and sons, if your daughter uh, become, uh, ha has puberty, puberty at 12 or 13 and she's having all these sexual thoughts and she has a boyfriend and you allow her to have a boyfriend, well then, what are you saying? You're saying, have a boyfriend but don't touch him? <laughs> right? Then, when we know that they, they had a boyfriend, um, some parents will say, oh, you gotta, we got to get rid of him, you have to break up with him. But then we're in an era where all of these children have cell phones. This is an era now where somebody can contact and interact with your child without any knowledge of, your, of yourself as the parent, right? So now, the daughter gets pregnant, you get angry, scream, cry, drag her to the abortion clinic and abort the kid. Right? But what if somebody else, what, what if the young man said, oh, that's not what I want to do. And I, I would like to have a say in it because, you know, it's my seed and, you know, this was our relationship and I, I'd like to keep this baby. There are mothers who would beat his ass, you know, <laughs> beat him to death or say he, he's the devil, you know. So I think this is all part of the conversation that we should be having with one another, whether you're in the church or the mosque or the synagogue or, you know, the collective, or the commune, or whatever you're into, these are the basic realities of life. Every one of us in here, around the age 13, 12, 14, reaches puberty and has certain kinds of thoughts and desires. We can't treat that like it doesn't happen, or no, that happened to them, but not me. Uh, now we have to provide some guidance as to what's supposed to happen next. Uh -huh. Did you ask a question before? No. no. Okay, good. Uh, um, I would like to say things on midnight and then um, before we get the air. I had my daughter at 16. All right, she says she had a daughter at 16. And their father, and my son at 19, and their father was um, a product of the Pentateuch of Kosinu, um, which came down from the school. And my daughter is 18 now and has a daughter. I'm a grandma. 
She says she's a grandmother. Yes. Her mom was in the prison system, just got home after doing 10 years. So, um, I, when I read Midnight, I was like, well, what is she talking about? What is it? What, this is not, I was like kind of disappointed at first because mm -hmm. I'm like, where's the connection? But then as I turned the pages and turned the pages, I got more and more engaged and more and more engaged. I said, I have to read, I mean, show Philip this book, my son. Mm -hmm. I have to show him this book because his father was born and he was like, you know, grow up as my protector now. Mm -hmm. He was a little man of my house. Mm -hmm. And when um, I, I read that book in 99 or something like that, when I had my two little boys, and when my daughter turned 13, I, showed, I, read, I made her read the, um, the Coldest Man I mm -hmm. Because I did not want her to be 16 and pregnant like me and, you know, go through the things that I went through with as, as a winner. Mm -hmm. North Philadelphia, not in, you know, Brooklyn. Right, I got you. So, um, I really appreciate those books. And, you know, I think that they should have made all the uh, uh, middle school for all the boys and the girls. The coach, the, the coach, I mean, the uh, coach for the should be in the high school for the girls. And, I, I Thank you. She said she thinks these books should be part of the curriculum. They should be in the school system, in the high school, and I like that. And I sent my boy, my kids, father, the book to the prison, you know, for him to read. And actually, you know, we was arguing about my son reading that book. He was like, why do you want him to read that book so much? I was like, because he really needs to read this book because, you know, he needs to know if he's going to be, um, you can you know, follow your steps in the plan or whatever. He needs to know, like, the morals. He needs to know the responsibilities. He needs to know how to treat his mother, you know, because he was already robbed of his father, you know, and, you know, all, all of that. So I, I really appreciate those books. So she says that her and her man were debating whether her son, their son, should read the midnight books or not and she thought that he should uh and she sent the book to the prison for her man and he wanted to know why she thought the son should read him at a young age and she said because he is the actual protector of my house and she he is the young man that's here so that's a good testimony thank you very much i appreciate it and uh I think we're going to wrap it up. Oh, we got a little young one. Just hear me and then we're done. Go ahead. Oh, how was it uh, being a rapper? Excuse me? How was it? His question is, how was it being a rapper? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's a good enough question. Um, I think I'm not really a rapper. To be honest with you, I was a college student who cared a lot about the world. And I was looking for a way to talk to my people about the things that I thought and the ways that we can do better and live better. And at the time, I had a bunch of young kids. They were going on a school trip. And these kids were wild, wild, wild New York kids. And they wouldn't listen to any adult, even a young adult. And I noticed when somebody put on an Eric B. and Rakim record, they all became one unified group. They all started rocking together, left, right, left. They started rhyming together. They were saying the same exact rhymes, and if somebody messed up a word, they yelled at each other <laughs> and corrected each other. And I stood on the bus, and I said, that's amazing. And then I realized that that was the connection to the youth. It was the hip-hop music. So when I got involved with hip-hop, it wasn't because I was that young girl that was sitting in my my room writing rhymes and trying to get put on because I wasn't her. I was a young girl from the Bronx that came from the projects, but I wasn't that young girl that had all the rhymes and all the finesse and style and all like that. Um, I was the, the, the passionate activist girl who said, if hip hop is the vehicle, then I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna ride in it. So my, my, my involvement as a rapper really was still as an activist or as a teacher to try to continue to push and press and create a pressure that caused our community to do good, to be good, to live good, and to be able to defend ourselves from evil. 
from racism, from white supremacy, and from our enemies. So that's my answer. Hope it works for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, another little girl. Okay, go ahead. Yes. What grade was I in when? Little girl, <laughs> first I was in kindergarten, <laughs> first, second, third, fourth. <laughs> I was in the same grades like you when I was little, but I was I was a very emotional little girl, so I was always thinking and overthinking. So that's how I became the woman that I am now. Thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, such a beautiful experience, everybody that's here. Um, give it up for Sister Soldier one more time, please. And for yourself.